welcome to the DeFi Download, a show about decentralized finance and all things crypto, where we dive into the details of the projects, assets, and services that are driving the DeFi revolution. I'm your host, Piers Ridyard, CEO of the Decentralized Finance Protocol, Radix, a public ledger entirely focused on bringing DeFi into the mainstream. Today, I'm joined by Traven co-founder of Immunify, crypto's leading bug bounty platform, protecting over $25 billion in user funds. Traven, thank you so much for coming on the show. Thank you very much, Fierce, for having me on board. Uh, I was following Radix for quite some time, so it's very, it's an honor to be here. <laughs> well, thank you. Thank you so much. It's great to have a fan on. Um, so we're like, let, let's, let's talk about, let's talk about the really simple stuff first. Like what is a bug bounty and like, why are they important? Sure. So a bug bounty is basically something where, I mean, to, to metaphorically like represent it, I like to think of it as like a store. It's a store where a project says, I'm willing to buy these vulnerabilities. Um, these are the specifications. If you have any of these, come to me and I'll pay you some money for it. And essentially just that, it's, it's, a pro it's projects trying to buy these vulnerabilities so that they can fix it themselves instead of having those exploited. Um, I think it's a, it, it's a way, you know, some people try to equate it to an audit, but it's not really that because one, you don't pay until you actually get what you're, you know, buying, what you've stated that you're buying and what you're really to pay for. Um, you don't get a report of sorts if nothing is there. It's just, you know, Hey, why am I not getting anything? Is it because it's really not out there or is it because, uh, my prices are too low? So, um, yeah, it's essentially a performance-based thing where, yeah, the white hat security uh, researcher community essentially will try to go up to you if they have something um, that they believe is valuable to you based on what you've stated. Um, okay, and yeah, so, so uh, go ahead. No, no, no. So, like, just to break that down a bit more, it's like if if you're a project in in De DeFi or in crypto, you're dealing with real money a lot of the time, or things that are convertible into real money. So, like Bitcoin or Ethereum, and the security of those things is entirely down to the systems that control the administration of that money, right? right? Either it being private keys that are on servers or are on like HSMs or a smart contract that has a bunch of administration functions that you can call and get it to do something or that there's some way you can call it and force it into an error state and end up in a situation where someone's able to make a contract do something it shouldn't. And in all those situations, money can disappear, right? Yes. And like we we recently had Polygon that had $600 million get hacked out of it, which is a layer two protocol where the contract essentially had a bad reference to a, a subcontract within it that meant that the hacker could go, kind of go, send me $600 million. Uh, and so these are the kind of vulnerabilities you're talking about finding, right? Yes. Um, so that one is actually Poly Network. It's not Polygon. Uh, oh, the Poly reason why Sorry. Yeah, Poly Network actually just became our client. So oh. uh, that, that's why I know about this. <laughs> yeah, uh, welcome Poly Network. Um, yeah, that's essentially what it is. I mean, we're trying to, these things that the vulnerability specifically that we're looking for are, or rather, sorry, our clients are looking for are the ones that can end up um, in the loss of user funds, um, either by direct theft or freezing, uh, maybe not the entire pool. Like a lot of times people think about the hacks of like, oh, the entire thing can be stolen. That's definitely possible as we've seen. Um, but it's also like, yeah, maybe just this single liquidity pool can have all of its funds drained, the rest are fine. These things are still being sought after. And yeah, the projects are essentially saying, hey, if you find one, don't exploit it. Come to us and we'll pay you. Right. And this is and this is like to this is basically the it like really comes down to the philosophy of open source in many ways as well. Right. Which is this idea that you make systems stronger by making it possible for people to investigate the system and attack it and then come back and, and, and tell people, well, I found this problem. I found this vulnerability. Uh, and like this didn't start with crypto. Right. This has been yep. something that's been going for a long time. Yes, absolutely. I mean, it's been going around since the late 90s, since 1997. I remember when the open source initiative was created um, and the open source movement was really kicking off. Um, in the uh, in the book by Eric Raymond in the Bazaar versus in the Cathedral, he correctly illustrated, you know, having so many eyes on the code essentially is a great way to spot the bugs. 
Um, I think somebody said, some other people in the open source community also said some similar quotes. I can't mention all of them right now, but um, I think that you know one key difference that we have uh, in the crypto space is that one, we're, we're lacking security researchers in the space. There's, it's not like you know, there's a huge, like thousands and thousands of people who understand um, blockchain, smart contracts, and everything around the crypto ecosystem to a degree that they can look into the code and find bugs. Um, and because there's a smaller group of people, um, we have to figure out ways to, you know, one, make sure that they actually spend time on it, and two, um, make them spend time on it instead of something else. Um, you know, so in the general open source community, you have all of these projects like large enterprises um, using certain smart um, open source code. And so they're incentivized to look at the code. And so they contribute to it as well, um, which is what we've seen a lot of projects around the Linux Foundation, um, which I've contributed to as well. So, you know, I'm all for the general open source um, approach to things where people contribute um, openly and things like that, not really re expecting anything directly back. Like I contributed to a white paper of a Linux Foundation project. I didn't get any, I didn't get paid, um, but I got a lot of indirect benefits, obviously. God damn it, Linus, that. give me my money. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, here, you know, with, with the smart contracts, it's like, we don't just have that many people in the space. And so uh, they need to be compensated because one, a lot of them are doing this part time. Uh, a lot of them have regular jobs, and so they need to, uh, if they start doing this full-time, they need to be compensated so that they get to live their life as well. And so, yeah, that's where I feel that we're really coming in and, and helping it out. It's really interesting. Now, like taking a, like a, a, a maximalist approach to crypto, right? Um, and, you know, th this, is, this is the kind of thinking that you saw in the earlier days of, of crypto. What I'm about to say, and I'm not actually necessarily saying this is what I believe, all right? But like, I think a lot of crypto uh, in the early days, especially proof of work and Bitcoin, based their, their ideals and ideas around this concept of um, of rational economic actors, right? Like the, the, the everyone is a purely rational economic actor uh, and that, that that is the way that you create these gains in these systems so that a rational economic actor can be nudged in a particular right way. And like in economics, you call this fallacy homo economicus or like the idea that you have this such thing as homo as rational economic man. Um, so like why would any hacker that is sufficiently good to find an exploit in one of these projects take a, a tenth, a hundredth, a thousandth, a millionth of the payout that they could get for just exploiting the hack on your platform than just, you know, exploiting the hack. Yeah. So um, first, yeah, I mean, that's one of the things we're trying to correct around bug bounty programs as well. I mean, the concept of bug bounty programs, we didn't invent it, right? It's been around for a long time. There's been a lot of companies doing it already. Projects do it themselves without our help. Um but one of the biggest problems is that a lot of the rewards are really small. They're not representative of the damage that can be done. And that's why we recommend our project, our clients as much as possible, uh, have a scaling bug bounty program where the critical vulnerability reward is based on the amount that can be stolen. So our base recommendation for that is 10%. So for example, if somebody can steal a hundred, uh, you know, 1 million, they get rewarded a hundred thousand. 5 million gets you 500,000. Of course, we also recommend bumping that up a little bit for PR considerations and things like that, especially if the white hat hacker is very um, helpful, really providing proof of concepts. Like that's not, you know, that's not a five minute job right there. Like they have to do a lot of things. Um, I mean, before, what, I mean, really one of the reasons why I pushed forward with it with my co-founders, uh, Mitchell and Duncan, is that it's really quite sad when I look at other bug bounty programs and see, you know, like a multinational Fortune 500 company have a bug bounty program where they'll pay out like ten thousand dollars if you can <laughs> shut down the entire system. Like, what? <laughs> what? I mean, no wonder why there's so many data leaks out there because it's either you sell the data and you get like you know a tenth of a penny for each person you leak out, or you get ten thousand dollars. I mean, you look at yeah. um, I'm not gonna <laughs> specific companies, but even in the top five of the tech companies, look at the amount of money they've paid out to bug bounty program. It's not a lot over the course of the history of their company. Um, so yeah, that's one thing we're trying to fix. Um, as to address your question as to, you know, 10% is still smaller than 100%. Right. Um, a lot of people, you know, there's, there's this, uh, 
FUD that's going around about crypto is, be, is used for money laundering. And the right. counter of co- argument of that is, of course, that no, it's not. We got a lot more legitimate uses within the crypto space than not. Right. And I, I go even further than that. And I say it would be entirely idiotic for anybody to do money laundering with crypto versus fiat if they had it in fiat already. Um, right. Money laundering in crypto is incredibly difficult. Um, people think that, oh, you can just send it to Tornado Cash. It's fine. Okay, 600 million in Tornado Cash. I think the total pool right now of Tornado Cash is around 400 million. So guess what? You're like half the pool, more than half the pool. <laughs> okay, cool. Now you got 600 million in ETH mm. that's coming from Tornado Cash. Good luck getting that anywhere. Mm. I mean, the moment you put that into an exchange, sorry, KYC, everything around there. Try to use it in a store. Yeah, okay, maybe you can spend $5 here, $5 there. It's going to take a long time to clean that money. Um, mm. I mean, with fiat, it's it's easy. Like You can have those go through it. the various different options you have that has been established for yeah, the past let's, 50, let's 100 years. Let's not go years. into the actual way in which you can <laughs> Yeah, I'm not, I'm not going to go into it. But, <laughs> but yeah, like in, in crypto, it's really hard. I mean, like just the fact that I mean, ask anybody who makes crypto as an as, as income and they try to take it to their bank. You know, they put it on exchange, sell it, move it to their bank account because they, they have bills to pay and it's in fiat. The bank mm. asks questions, even for a thousand bucks. Imagine right. 600 million. And so, right. um, you know, okay, you don't get 600 million, but you get 60 million. Um, or, you know, even if it's like a 10 million hack and 1 million, let's do that because it's a bit more, uh, I, I, I think, like, easier for people to grasp that like you get 1 million in clean cash that you can literally take to an ODC desk the next day and say, Hey, I'd like to cash this out. And they're going to ask, how'd you get it? Right. And I said, oh, you say, Oh, bug bounty program. Here's the proof. Um, yeah. Right. And here's the bug that I reported. They're like, okay, great. Good right. job. Yeah. And it's, it's, it's a really interesting, it's a really interesting, uh, mind shift and it's been sort of, I, I've, I've come into it later. I, I wasn't in the early, in the early days of, um, sort of software, uh, and, and, um, in the nineties when people were building software, but I know from stories of like, sometimes a, a, a white hat hacker would uncover a vulnerability. They'd come to the company and the company would try and sue them. The company would like actually yeah. come after them. Yeah, and it's like it's the exact it's the exact opposite of what you should be doing. Um, Absolutely, and I think I think I think now it's becoming clear like that this is this is that the bug bouncings are exactly the right thing. The other thing that often I I see people getting frustrated with um, is if the if the exploit is easy, right? So it's like oh, uh, someone's just uncovered an exploit that would mean that they can steal, you know, 50 million out of a smart contract, but it was just like a misplaced comma, or it was like, or it was, you know, it was a really simple call. Uh, and it's, and and they're like, well, you didn't have to do much work to, to, to get that. Why should we pay you so much money? Yeah. And, and it's like, it's not the point. That's not the point. Yeah. The point is what's of what's at risk, not yeah. how difficult or easy the exploit was. Um, Absolutely. And I mean, if it's an easier exploit, then I mean, even then, you maybe should pay it quicker because then their attack opportunity is literally any time within five seconds of them saying, ah, "Yeah, I'll attack." You know, <laughs> it, it, yeah, absolutely. Like you're supposed to base this off the impact, and that's why our so we use our own severity classification system, for example, and it's impact based for especially for the smart contract side because right. you can do a very convoluted way, and if all you can do is you know. DOS a smart contract that doesn't hold people's money for five minutes. Okay, it's really complicated, but sorry, that's probably just like a medium in terms of the severity scale. Um, meanwhile, yeah, yeah, one simple attack that's just because somebody forgot a comma or something, you know, quite basic, steal everybody's user funds or lock them permanently, as as we've seen in in some um, hacks in the past. Uh, yeah doesn't matter it's the impact that matters and it's it's the user funds at risks that matters so you you guys are currently protecting 25 billion in user funds it's probably uh, higher and now. have <laughs> and probably higher now and and have so far paid out how much in in bug bounties 
Oof, I'm not sure. I didn't check. I didn't check a while ago. I need to check that. Um, I think it's actually think, on the top of your website. Bounty spit yeah. out more than three million dollars yeah. at the top. It, is, uh, oh, it's it's decently more than three million now. Um, okay. I I don't have the the most recent figures. I should, but uh, there's a lot of stuff going on at the same time, and there's also a lot of stuff right now that you know I can't really talk about. Like there might be if there's a bug report that's currently um, being reviewed by a client. Obviously, I can't say anything as long, until the post mortem gets out. Um, but yeah, we, we've, we've had quite a lot of payouts come out already. Um, it was actually quite scary when we had the first one. Um, well, scary mostly because like, is this actually happening? Is this going to happen? I mean, we were fairly confident about it, but, uh, we were still very new. It is, I mean, I think we, like we launched in December, this happened around, um, the last week of January. Uh, and actually I was moving at the time <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> so it was a perfect, perfect scenario, by the way, while moving, um, no, I mean, this guy, his name is Alexander Schlinvein. He doxed himself, so we're happy to say his name as well. Um, he found a vulnerability in one of the projects that just onboarded uh, that could have drained the entire TVL, all of it. Wow. Everything. Um, wow. And yeah, he disclosed the bug report, uh, and the reward was one million of the project's tokens, which was Armor Finance. Um, at the time, I think uh, when they had that reward, that that was about twenty five thousand dollars in ETH, uh, right? Oh no, sorry, twenty five thousand dollars in their token, um, and their token price spiked uh, since their token got released, and it was like I think seven hundred thousand dollars, <laughs> uh, and I was like, boy, that is the world's largest bug bounty payout at the time, um, and I was like, well, this we, we this is the make or break, right? Like if this guy actually gets paid. We've done it. We've we've satisfied the one of the biggest concerns of bug bounty hunters. One which you correctly pointed out is that some projects sue them. This is the case with the traditional finance companies, especially, um, or not pay out at all. Um, and of course, the Armor Finance guys are really good people. Um, Robert, the CTO, even had a clause in there that he'd have to get a tattoo um, in the honor <laughs> of, of Alexander, and he did. He did. He did. He got a tattoo. Amazing. He did. Uh, and one of our team members in person verified it. So, yep, he has the tattoo. Um, and, you know, no, what's, they the tattoo, out... what's the tattoo of? It just, uh, just his name or what? No, so um, Alexander's um, Twitter handle is called Bobface. And so it's a photo, it's a, it's a tattoo of Bob Ross, like, choking uh, a hacker. <laughs> <laughs> it's really cool. Um, it, it's fantastic. He's, he's a tattoo artist. I don't know their name, but great job. Great job. Uh, but yeah, no, I, like, we were scared, like, you know, uh, this is this make or break it. And we were very happy that, you know, Robert himself is actually a, a formerly a bug bounty hunter. Um, so it went very smoothly. Um, everyone, it, it went really well. Um, but I was also scared. It's like, okay, what's their community going to think now when they actually get paid out? Because that's a lot of money, right? And in the project token. Mm. Um, but we really, we, we worked with the team and their, their PR and marketing team and you know, when they communicated it to their community, everybody loved it. It was just framed in a way of like, you could have lost everything. Um, and now instead you have this guy who, who found a vulnerability and we patched it. Nobody lost money. Um, and their token price uh, started going up. Um, obviously with a $700,000 bug bounty payout, uh, last, the, low, the second, sorry, the highest one before then, which was, uh, I believe by Intel, was $200,000 at most. So you, yeah, this is significantly, this is more than three times the amount of that. Uh, I mean, there might have been some private bug bounty programs before, but this is the first one that's public. Um, yeah, I, I, I read and, something about Facebook paying out a million dollar one like a yeah. long time ago. I'll have to, I'll have to see if I can find that. But I like, that, it's, uh, it, it's, it's like, that's super unusual. Seven hundred thousand is yeah. amazing. I'm not trying to belittle it at yeah, all. Yeah, like, no, I, yeah, mo, mo, you're right. Most of them, and like Facebook actually came into under a lot of criticism when they changed their bug bounty program to become substantially less yeah. uh, generous. And then it, then it had this review process as well, where they would just be like, it would they would be like, oh, it can be up to this, and then they come back and it'd be like thirty percent of what yeah. the, was thought to going to be paid out and stuff like that. Yeah. But yeah, I mean, it absolutely. And I, I think the Facebook one, I think their published amount was actually lower. And then so they just increased it as well. Or I think that one might have been outside of the program. I don't remember fully. Um, but the Intel one, it was like uh... a public bug bounty program. It's like, this is how much we will pay. And that they claimed that. Um, but yeah, actually, when, when uh, Coindesk covered the entire thing, 
everyone loved it so much their token price doubled. So the guy made one point five million dollars. <laughs> So the so the so what you're saying is the 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 message that we need to be putting to the folks at home is put some vulnerabilities in your code, put them up as a bug bounty, and then this is free marketing. Is that is that what you're saying? <laughs> no, definitely not. Please make your <laughs> code as secure I, I, as possible. I, I, I hear you loud and clear. That is exact. <laughs> like fight. Put some vulnerabilities on. Get yourself on Immunify. Get them found before you go live. Write about it in Coin Telegraph. Jobs are good. Um, yeah, absolutely. So, um, how? Like, it, obviously, you can. You, this, this is a two-sided marketplace, right? Yeah, Immunify is a two-sided marketplace. You have, you have, the projects who who want to give away tokens to uh to, to 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 find vulnerabilities but what crypto i think has shown us more than more than anything else is that it isn't just how much money you have it's also audience like yep. crypto is great at throwing obscene amounts of money at very very tiny audiences um and even though i go on immunify and i can see that you know uh the graph is offering 2.5 million dollars in rewards x die is up to 2 million cream finance 1.5 delta 1.5 sushi 1.25 million dollars of rewards that's like that's a huge amount of money how do you guys but how do you go that makes it sound like it'd be easy to go and find hackers, but I'm assuming it's not. So like, talk a little bit about that. Yeah. I mean, as I mentioned at the start, there aren't a lot of security researchers around smart contracts and blockchain. Um, and a lot of the people who are really good at it, like I mentioned, have jobs. Um, most of them are working in the crypto spaces. You know, it's not bad. Um, but a lot of those who, yeah, just want to look around and find vulnerabilities and have that skill set. Like, you know, just because you're a good developer doesn't mean you're going to be a good hacker. It really requires a specific mindset and, and approach. And um, honestly, also just tenacity and perseverance, because a lot of times you're going to look through stuff and not find anything and you, you're not going to get paid anything uh, unless you're an auditor, in which case, yeah, you get, you get paid a salary and that's fine. But I mean, the bug bounty hunter is really different. Um, yeah. I mean, with that, with that amount of money, we are able to attract a lot of the existing ones in the space. Uh, so that's that's the not mean problem, and also because of of um, Armor Finance having the process being very smooth, um, a lot of hackers have come to our platform with greater confidence. Um, I mean, we've actually had right. a greater, a larger payout since then to the same guy. <laughs> to the, the same, same guy. Same guy. Yes, uh, we have a postmortem <laughs> for that as well it's for Fay Protocol. Um, but yeah, no, I mean, we've had other large payments as well uh, on our platform and they've happened because uh, the hackers have a confidence. So that's one part. The other part is, that, yeah, we, we need to invest. We found out that we need to invest in growing this, this community around um, people who understand this. So we've started a couple of initiatives. Um, we're working with a lot of different um, education providers. So if you go to our website, we have you know a section where people can learn about smart contracts, blockchain, crypto, and yeah, we also have a community around Discord where people just help each other out and share, you know, tips on on learning things. And a lot of these people coming in are actually some of the best web and app hackers in the space. And so, you know, they have the right approach, they have the right um, skill set entirely, and it's just a matter of getting them to learn. Um, one of the things that that was a bit of a risk, but it's paid off quite well, was this thing called the White Hat Scholarship. Uh, where essentially we find these promising hackers who have, you know, really exhibited themselves to be very skillful, very knowledgeable, and most importantly, uh, well, also equally importantly, sorry, uh, they have the right attitude. Um, a lot of times bug bounty hunters will send a report, it looks valid, everything's good, but then get told, sorry, it's a duplicate issue, somebody beat you by an hour. Or um, actually, there's this mitigation you can see here. You just missed it entirely. Sorry, your five hours of writing this up has gone to waste. Um, and yeah, we essentially just sponsor them. And we tell them like, hey, we want you to spend more of your time learning. So here's some money. Here's a stipend. And yeah, we, we'll, uh, we just want to see you learn more and understand this more so you can become a better hacker. Um, and I think, yeah, that's, that's really the only way for us to really grow this space because we don't have enough hackers. We have a lot of projects coming up in the space. We have probably more projects launching sometimes, especially during that big bull market than, uh, 
you know, really qualified hackers coming onto the space and um, being white hats. So, yeah. so what 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 makes a good hacker? Like, what have you noticed over over the years of like being consistently seeing, or, or maybe not? Maybe maybe like it's just there's no consistent personality type. There's no consistent background. It's just like what? But I'm curious. What what? What, how does a how does a good what is a good when you when you're doing these scholarships like what are you looking for for example? Um, so I don't run the scholarship side of things. I don't uh, you know communicate directly with the hackers. I, I handle more on the client relation side of things these days. Although I do engage with the hackers every now and then. I think good communication is a very important thing. Um, being able to communicate properly the vulnerability that you found. I mean, one way to do it, of course, is to provide a proof of concept. Um, but being abrasive. Uh, really will just get you nowhere. Um, I mean, I oh, there's of course also you know companies as, as you mentioned before that get abrasive and sue the bug bounty hunters. So mm. we're trying to control that side, but also for the hackers, um, yeah, um, being being understanding about the entire process, um, communicating the bug report as clear as possible really just makes things a lot better. Um, and of course, having the right skill set and technical knowledge to be able to understand if something is an actual vulnerability or not, of course, is very helpful. Um, yeah, I mean, a lot of people think the, uh, a lot of the hackers are these shadowy figures, um, but maybe some some are definitely. We don't we don't we don't require KYC on our platform mainly because also our clients are the one paying them out directly. Um, right. But no, a lot of them say their names publicly. They're completely fine with it. Sometimes it's to promote their own projects. Um, yeah, it, they're just like you and me. <laughs> Hopefully, nice well, people. One, 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 one of my one of my friends um, goes to DefCon in mm-hmm. uh, Vegas every year, and it's really funny his preparation for DefCon because it's like he he um, like doesn't bring mobile phones with him. He doesn't yep. bring any computers with him. He basically walks around with no devices, and then uh, when he leaves. He he buys he buys he he buy he he takes old clothes and then the old clothes that he 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 wore there he then just throws them out or gives them to charity. I'm like that seems excessive. He's like, yeah, but you can never be too careful. Like, um, and it sounds like a fascinating place to go. So, like, is that where you guys go to recruit? Do you go guys go to things like DefCon conference and just be like, you can get two point five million dollars. Come here, come roll up, roll up, hackers. <laughs> I mean, I, I think like uh, my colleagues might try to do that at some point in time. Um, yeah, yeah. I we haven't been able to go to events as much. I mean, I went to a few events sure. since we launched. Um, I've actually spoken, for example, at the Hackers Congress, the annual Hackers Congress in Prague. Uh, not so much about computer hacking, more about other stuff. Um, okay. On the crypto, it's like a it's this Bitcoin only cafe or sorry crypto only cafe in the Czech Republic called Parlani Police. Okay. Um, so it's a it's a right, really nice community there. Um, but yeah, we we haven't really been able to go out to these events yet. But so most of our outreach has just been online. And yeah, I mean a lot of the projects coming in with these huge bug bounty programs um, that also attracts hackers to their programs. I mean it's 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 also a competition, like I mentioned. Uh, it's our it's our own clients competing against each other for the attention of the hackers, and that works well for the hackers. So they 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 come to our platform. Got it. Okay, um, that's really cool. So like, how, how about yourself? Like, is your background hacking? Did you did you how did you how did you end up in Immunify? How did you end up co-founding Immunify? Um, no, I'm actually, my, I mean, my background's in business actually academically, okay. but the reason why I picked that is because I get bored easily with things, and so I like doing interesting things um i i uh started in web marketing um but i i was really interested in teaching myself technically so i mean i remember when i was a child my father bought a a computer uh windows 95 and just put me in front of it and said figure it out let's go (laughs) and so uh, actually like before college a lot of people thought i would go into software development i mean we had coding classes in high school where i was born in the philippines um and i was able to complete all of the assignments like within minutes while most people took an hour so but i i i wasn't really that interested in you know sitting down in front of the computer a lot which interestingly is what i ended up doing today Mm -hmm. um but uh yeah my uh i 
my background is quite varied. I mean, I've I've done a lot of things. Um, I've I've even lived in the Arctic and was a tour guide up there for a while and needed to learn how to shoot a rifle. Um, it's very important yeah. background for hacking. I mean, yeah. I'm, I bet, bet, bet you. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, that sounds amazing. What was it? Was it? Was it? Was it? Would you recommend it to anyone, or was it like? Is it a te- like? Yeah. Oh yeah. What's the Arctic like? Oh, the Arctic's great. I lived in this place called Longyearbyen Svalbard. So it's about northeast of Greenland. It's the northernmost okay. uh, permanently inhabited town in the world. Beautiful place. Uh, we have four months, about four months of no sun and four months of only sun. Um, it's really cold. It's really cold. Um, yeah, I lived there for about 19 months. Really met, met a lot of nice people up there. Really nice people. Um, no, actually, I, you know, some people joke, like, how do you learn how to code in one day? And you go up to the Arctic right before the midnight sun, uh, right before the polar <laughs> night. And uh, yeah, that's one night and spend four months just learning how to code. And hey, we have a blues festival right before the last uh, sun sundown. So nice. <laughs> nice. Uh, but no, my, my, my background is quite varied. I mean, I've always kept in touch in terms of like tax, you know, I mean, that's how I got into crypto back in 2013. Actually, I, I got introduced to Bitcoin in 2011. Um, but I stayed away from it because I was um, trying to immigrate to the United States at the time. And my friend introduced me to it sort of in the context around Silk Road. And I'm like, I don't want to touch that. I'm, you know, I need a visa here. Um, but no, I mean, I, I, I still just kept following crypto. I kind of dropped out because of, uh, I mean, like stopped following it rather because of some life issues, like in the mid uh, between 2014, 2016. And then I got back into it when I reached the Arctic, actually. Um, and yeah, I just, what I did to, to get expertise in this space, I mean, I don't still call myself an expert. I'm still learning. I'm learning all the time. Um, it's just saying yes to a lot of things and contributing. So like I mentioned, I contributed to the Linux foundation, um, that, that the white paper was Hyperledger. Um, mm. and I contributed to that. Um, yeah. And I learned so much throughout that process. Uh, and as that's the case with almost any open source project, like the, the best way to learn something is to contribute to it. So, um, I, I worked largely for free for six months to just build up better understanding around crypto, better understanding around blockchain. Um, and I was very grateful and I, I will forever be to the people uh, until to th- this day who helped me understand things and teach me. I mean, I can never say I'm self-taught, um, because it's always been people teaching me all along the way. Um, and yeah, I've just been saying to so yes to so many things, and in exchange for that, like I, I mean, twenty sixteen, we didn't get paid a lot. <laughs> mm. You know, uh, like I think I was I was working with the NXT Foundation, where I met Mitchell, uh, my my co founder as well at Immunify right now, and uh, yeah, we, you know, didn't get paid a lot, and but it was okay. We learned so much during that time. Um, I kept learning. I, I, I ended up co-founding a, a, another project called Stoker, which is a fundraising platform on Ethereum and also now on the Liquid Network um, by Blockstream. And, you know, I learned a lot about finance and financial law there. Uh, I didn't know a lot of financial law at the time. And um, also with just my involvement with various different consulting projects that I've been part of, I learned so much around different industries. And so I just, you know, bring them all together uh, with Immunify. But yeah, I mean as you network around the space more, you meet a lot of people and become friends with people who've lost a lot of money, not just because they invested in projects that got Mm. hacked, but they were the founders. Uh, One person that I know, he might be watching this video, so I'm not going to mention his name, but hello, you know who you are. Um, uh, He he was involved in one of the first hacks around Ethereum, Um, not the DAO hack. Right, the DAO Um, hack. Not not the the DAO, DAO. not not the DAO hack, um, but one of uh, the parody hack. Uh, the parity hack. Okay. Yeah. So we, we, was that was that a hack or was that just a mistake? Well, I mean, if somebody uh, you know mistakenly b- uh, builds a gate and there's actually a way to break the lock, who's you know, <laughs> yeah, 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 is enough. it still a hack yeah, yeah. or is it still a <laughs> trespassing if they break through it? Um, yeah. we, we're not talking about the wallet, the the parity wallet where they locked funds. We're talking about no, that's a the second one. one. So the, the first that one. That was the second one. So the yeah. first one. Okay. Yeah, because yeah. the second one where they locked like, so many funds and they couldn't get that it. That was a lot yeah. of money. Um, it was a lot of money. Yeah. But um, the first one yeah, is still the, like, the first one. projects like lost $10 million, but that was $10 million in 27, mid-2017 Ether price. Right. 
Yeah, that's right. like forty thousand. Right. Which which we, which is which is really painful in two regards. One because Ethereum's gone up so much, but two because actually there was less money in the space. Yes, and so that was represented more runway for people as well. Yeah, and um, I mean, like I said, you know, people back then they worked a lot of times without pay. Uh, and because these this right. team, they were those kind of people, because a year ago, literally, they weren't being paid. They just kept contributing. Um, they actually used their own money to fund the project for another year or so. Um, and now, the, unfortunately, the project's no longer, being, no longer continued. But yeah, they. so not only did they lose money from the hack, they've put in their own blood, sweat, and tears into the project and more of their money. Um, so it, it, it's painful for me to watch. And... Yeah, I mean, Mitchell got tired of seeing it. I got tired of seeing it. Um, and yeah, so we decided to co found Amidify. And then we met Duncan along the way, uh, and who's been a fantastic contributor. I mean, he's our CTO, really. Like, we couldn't be here without him. So um, yeah, we're just trying to make the space more secure. I, I really, I'm, I'm very okay, and this might be an unpopular uh, opinion. I'm really okay if projects fail and people lose money as long as it failed because it was actually economically broken. Um, right. Because then there's data. Right. There's data right. that all everybody else can be like, okay, that didn't work. Let's not do right. that again. But let's figure out maybe right. what did work and build on that. I mean, that's really how it is. That's the open source uh, you know, approach to things. It's, it's learning right. from people's mistakes and improving upon them. But it's really sad to me if a project dies, and if, if an experiment dies because of a hack. I mean, not right. only have people lost money, the crypto community as a whole has lost information on whether what they were doing was right or not. Yeah. And I also think I also think it's the same reason that or similar. I mean, not to not to mm. draw like um, uh, analogies too much on this, but like the same reason that people get more upset about children dying than adults dying. It's like mm. the 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 this is a thing that had promise, had opportunity that it hadn't fulfilled. Yeah. Uh, and and wasn't able to wasn't able to blossom uh, and was sort of cut off early and and that and that um, that that definitely feels that way for for projects that are, and like Radix almost died like that um, it was a it was a direct hack but Dan Hughes the, the 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 founder of Radix and when he was running the project on his own uh, in like 2014. Mm-hmm. Um, was was hacked, and uh, instead of letting the project die, he 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 sold his house to keep the project going. But it was yeah, it was it was touch and go, uh, and it was only the fact that he had been very successful before and been able to build up like some kind of buffer that meant he could just you know keep going, and that he was so determined that it wouldn't kill it that it, it carried on. But yeah, like uh, th- those things are definitely more common than they should be. So. Yeah. Tell me about tell me about um, MakerDAO because you guys have just just done a great announcement about MakerDAO. So what's what's happened there? Yeah, so we're working with the uh, uh, Maker ecosystem. So they've they've split up, they've shut down their foundation, and are now having these various uh, DAO teams, which are called core units. And we're uh, we're working with the uh, sustainable ecosystem scaling core unit, um, being incubated with them, and we're going to create a immunify security core unit specifically for the maker ecosystem. So it's going to include a bug bounty program, of course, but um, it's going to be a bit unique because, you know, there's no team that d- dictates to me uh, what, the bug, what the bug bounty program should be. So we're really going to go out there and structure that for the maker ecosystem. And it's quite an honor working with them. I mean, they're the DeFi project and um, it's, it's really been great seeing them actually go this decentralization route. Like there were a lot of skeptics in the early days. I'll admit, I was one of them. I was like, I okay. was one of them. I remember like, when they were like, we're going to decentralize eventually. I was like, yeah, whatever. Yeah, sure. Like, <laughs> join the queue. Join the queue. And they did it. I was like, wow. Yeah. So, yeah, um, we're going to also provide other um, services to the maker ecosystem. A lot of that is still yet to be announced. Uh, we're working on it. Um, but yeah, it, it's going to be a very different approach. Um, so yeah, we're, we're, we're very excited to move forward with that. We are probably going to have a request for comments, um, on September 8th. Um, hopefully we get to, we get to that phase and then we look forward to hearing further comments from the maker community. That's really cool. And so, and so the, the objective of this is, is you say, 
sustainable ecosystem scaling or sustainable ecosystem growth? Scaling. So that's that's the core unit that's in charge of growing yeah. the uh, the maker ecosystem. And, and, and so why does, it, other... why does why does why does this sort of bug bounty come under like scaling rather than like security no, so, is its own thing? So the bug bounty is under uh, the Immur- Immunify Security Core Unit, and we as an Immunify Security Core Unit are currently being incubated by the Sustainable uh, uh, Ecosystem Scaling uh, Core Unit. I hope uh, I got the correct for SES. I keep calling them just SES. Um, <laughs> But yeah, they, they're in charge of making sure that the ecosystem can scale well with various different core units um, in the ecosystem. So like if you had a if you had a magic wand standing now, like mm-hmm. what would you want to change or improve about how the ecosystem works at the moment? What do you think like what if, specifically for things around bug bounties and hacking mm-hmm. and all that kind of stuff. Like what do you think needs, what's the behavior change you think is really important that more founders, more projects understand? Um, well, the nice thing is some projects are already starting to get this mindset, which is fantastic, mm-hmm. uh, which is that you need to budget for paying out hackers who find out bugs in your platform. Um, I mean, you can get the best audits, around the space and, you know, not bashing any aud- auditors at all. Like some of them are, are personal friends of mine. Um, we work with some of their, the auditing companies, um, but they're human. And there are, there are vulnerabilities that perhaps they just don't know exist. I mean, there've been some bug, uh, bugs that have been discovered that we've never seen before. Like, wow, we didn't know that attack vector was entirely possible at all. Um, right. So it's hard to blame the auditors for not spotting those. And but there's also also like the thing I've heard recently is that mm. auditors are under extreme pressure. Like yes, there are yes. too many projects needing auditing, which means yep. that many auditors are having to expand their team really quickly, which means that audits aren't maybe as like diligent as they should be. And I sometimes see people being like, well, our code's audited, so it's fine. Like uh, there was this uh, one particular famous conversation that recently ha- happened, like started in Telegram, went to Twitter of like a guy reaching out and being like, hey, I found a vulnerability. And the and someone coming down and being like, yeah, well, we're audited, so probably not go away. Uh- yeah, <laughs> I, I, I've 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 had that. So we do this thing called disclosure assistance as well, where it's a community service. I mean, of course, it's also a sales funnel for me. But um, basically, if one of our community members finds a vulnerability in another project that's not a client of ours, as long as they hit the minimum thresholds of impact, I take my time and actually go to the project. Um, and this is more common in the earlier days of Immunify than now. I think now, I think some people are scared when they get a direct message from me. <laughs> like one of my friends, I, I, I messaged him like, hey, uh, hey, how's it going? And they met, he's like, what's going on? Are we being hacked? Oh my goodness. And I'm like, I just wanted to see if you wanted to have lunch next week. You know? <laughs> Chill. Uh, but no, yeah, like some of the projects, their first response to me was like, that's impossible. We're audited by this company. I'm like, cool. Here's a proof of concept. It works. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, okay, I don't disclose a proof of concept that easily, but uh, you know, it's 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 a it's a mindset that needs to be fixed. And a lot of projects, actually, surprisingly, like when I talk to them now, um, even the ones that don't reach out to us already have this mindset of like, yeah, we are willing to hear if you have a vulnerability. But I think the next step towards that is that people need to budget for this while they're like planning their project. Um, some teams have done, um, you know, certain interesting things also like, uh, having, um, the payout being able to, to become, to be coming out from their treasury. I mean, that's how it's going to be with maker. Um, it's going to be from the protocol itself. It's not going to be from a specific team because there's some, um, and it's the same mm. for, uh, so- sovereign was one of our first, uh, projects that onboard into our platform. And they were the first ones where, uh, the bug bounty program was actually through an improvement proposal, which I wrote. Uh, it's actually the first improvement proposal that I wrote. And um, yeah, so the money isn't even from the team. It's like literally from the community. And I think getting the community involved is actually such a great way around this because um, there's, of course, concerns when teams say like, okay, well, we're, you know, if a black hat hacker steals funds, um, that those funds aren't the team's funds. Like some of them might be the user funds and they'll be like, well, we can't negotiate with the hacker. We can't, if they say, uh, we'll send back 90%, let me keep 10%. Well, we can't negotiate on behalf of our users. Like, well, I'm pretty sure a lot, one, a lot, I'm pretty sure a lot of your community might actually be willing to give up the 10%, but we'll see. 
Um, but on the other, like, absolutely, I understand needing to get input from your community. So having these voting, you know, these pr protocols essentially in place within the project on what to do um, is good. And it's even better if it's a bug bounty program, because then you're dealing with a white hat hacker who's tends to be at least much nicer than a black hat. Mm. It seems like I almost feel like um, the the distinction between a white hat hacker and a white black hat hacker is that a white hat hacker tends to be like they have the same skill set, but the white hat ha hacker is able to deal with people better. <laughs> and the black hat <laughs> hacker just gets pissed off with dealing with stupid projects. It's like, screw it. I'm just going to exploit yeah. it. Um, far easier. I don't have to deal with people then. Um, it, a lot of Traven, times, it's yeah. been so it's been such a pleasure having you on. Um, if, if people want to find out more about Immunify, where do they go? And if projects want to get at, get in contact, how do they do that? Sure. Um, yeah, anybody who wants to learn more about Immunify, just come to our website, immunify.com. We have a Twitter account. We have a Discord group as well. All these links are on our website. Um, if you're interested in onboarding, um, just go to the projects page on our website as well. It goes through all the information about how we operate how we don't charge any onboarding fees or maintenance fees and just have performance fees. So yes, we take that gamble as well with it. Uh, or with the hackers, sorry, rather. So if you don't, actually, great marketing opportunity, by the way, for projects who have who think that they have super clean code and no no bugs at all. Free marketing. Uh, yeah, you can sign up there. You fill out a contact form and uh, we'll get back to you as soon as possible. And all potential hackers that can come and hack projects, there is $32 million of bounties available right now on Immunify. So go sign up uh, and start playing around with projects. Thank you so much, Traven. Uh, I hope you have a wonderful day. And uh, thank you so much for coming on the show. Thank you very much as well, Pierce. It's been great being here.